So my name is Joanne Park and I'm a child and adolescent psychiatry fellow. And so the title of my presentation today is um, Anxiety and Youth with High Functioning ASD and What Do We Do? So this is the LEND disclaimer statement. And so I became interested in this topic because as a child psychiatry fellow at UC Davis in our outpatient clinic, many kids with high functioning autism present for treatment of anxiety. So for my talk today, I'll be going through some background information, the methods, results, findings from the literature and future directions. So for some background information, so roughly 40% of children with ASD meet criteria for at least one anxiety disorder compared to about five to 32% in typically developing children. And the most common anxiety disorders include social phobia, OCD is included because DSM-4 was used here, um, social anxiety disorder and generalized anxiety disorder. And there are also can be significant overlap between anxiety symptoms and the core features of autism, which can unfortunately delay the diagnosis of anxiety. And so it's also been shown that 46% of children with autism have atypical anxiety symptoms that aren't consistent with any DSM-5 criteria. And these atypical anxieties include unusual fears and anxiety around autism related challenges like excessive worrying when the environment or schedule changes. And so it's important to be able to diagnose promptly and provide appropriate treatment because anxiety in youth with autism can exacerbate social difficulties, impair daily living skills and negatively impact relationships with family and peers. So for my project, I did a literature review and I included here the search terms that I used. So for my inclusion criteria included ages 18 and under, I included any study that had an intervention for youth with ASD. And so I looked at both primary and secondary research articles, but excluded case studies. So anxiety was measured as an outcome. IQ was greater than 70 and papers were in English and published in a peer reviewed journal. And I focused on the past five years, but did go back 10 years for highly relevant studies. So I started with Google Scholar and I identified highly relevant articles to this topic. Then I did a search on PubMed and also used PubMed to look at the similar articles that came up from the highly relevant articles from Google Scholar. And then I also used the database Scopus, which is a great resource for references and citations. So in total, I identified 135 papers. I removed the duplicates and then I screened by abstract and method and then screened by full text and was left with 42 studies that met in inclusion criteria. So for these 42 papers, I categorized them broadly by intervention. So papers that looked at both non-pharmacological and pharmacological. And so what I mean by this is that is studies that are looking at treatment of anxiety that includes both medication and non-medication modalities like psychotherapy. And then I have the non-pharmacological group and then the pharmacological. And then I further identified them um, by what type of, by what type of study it was. So whether it was a primary research. And so this is where the authors conduct the studies themselves versus secondary research where, which are the reviews, the meta-analyses where the authors interpret studies conducted by others. And so for the first category here, um, there were zero primary research articles and four secondary research, which were reviews. And then the non-pharmacological interventions were the most common at 24 primary research papers and 11 secondary research articles. And then lastly, for the pharmacological interventions, it was very sparse with only three primary research articles. And so starting with the findings from the non-pharmacological studies. So cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT has been the most studied and it has shown to be moderately efficacious. So what is CBT? So CBT emphasizes the interconnectedness between our thoughts, feelings, and behavior, and that they can all affect each other. And so CBT for anxiety has four main components, which include psychoeducation, cognitive restructuring, relaxation techniques, and graded exposure. So there have been three meta-analyses looking at the 
efficacy of CBT in this population. So CBT has been found to be superior with a moderate effect size. And the intervention characteristics in, in these studies varied quite a bit in the number of sessions ranging from six to 32 and lasting anywhere from one to two hours per session and were provided in an individual or group setting with or without family involvement. And there were many variations of the CBT as well. So standard or unmodified CBT programs may be effective, but it may not allow the flexibility that's often needed in kids with autism. And so to address this limitation, modular CBT programs have been developed. And so these modification, modifications include like reducing the cognitive component and increasing behavioral strategies, tailoring communication to include concrete language, visual materials, and hands-on activities, um, using the child's special interests, having the parents involved in the sessions, and focusing on difficulties related to anxiety and ASD, like social skills, behavioral issues, and adaptive living skills. And two of the most well-studied modular CBT programs include BIACA, which is um, an individual CBT program versus facing your fears, which is a group CBT. And so there are also additional predictors and moderators that impact treatment outcomes. And so predictors of poor treatment outcomes include severe internalizing and externalizing symptoms, um, elevated repetitive behaviors and restricted interests, high intolerance, high, higher intolerance of uncertainty, and high accommodation by anxiety by family, like changing their routines and expectations for the child. Uh, moderators of improved outcomes included older age, treatment duration of greater than 12 weeks, and parental involvement in the sessions. So there are also different methods of delivery. And so it, we, we found it was shown that individual and group CBT have been found to have similar efficacy. School-based modified CBT interventions have also shown significant reductions in anxiety. And there have also been studies looking at internet-based standard CBT programs. So for Brave Online, the treatment group didn't have any significant differences in the remission of the primary anxiety diagnosis, but there was an overall reduction in anxiety. And Camp Cope a Lot, is, um, which is based on Coping Cat, did see a clinically significant improvement in anxiety. And there was a randomized control trial looking at brief virtual reality with CBT for specific phobias, which was found to be effective for some. And so there's been increasing evidence that CBT is an effective treatment, but there are limitations in that there hasn't been a large randomized control trial. And in many of the studies, the treatment group was compared to weightless controls or treatment as usual. And they were mostly conducted in controlled clinical settings. And there are also many different types of CBT programs with the lack of studies comparing the different types. So switching our gears to alternative non-pharmacological interventions. So there was a systematic review looking at the efficacy of mindfulness. And the findings were mixed with some finding improvement in anxiety and others not. And in, in in these programs, the parents were heavily involved in that they received the mindfulness training as well or participated in a parallel group. And these programs showed a significant reduction in parental stress. And so mindfulness can potentially be effective, but currently there isn't enough evidence to support it. And then another important area is examining the impact of social skills groups on anxiety. So PEERS is an effective social skills pro program and a theater-based peer-mediated intervention have both shown to improve social competence and reduce anxiety and social interactions. Another area of emerging research is using video games. And so MindLight is a serious video game that's been designed for anxiety. And so there were no differences in the child-rated anxiety symptoms, but there was a decrease of the parent-rated child anxiety symptoms in the experimental group. For pharmacological findings, so selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors or SSRIs are amongst the most commonly prescribed medications in youth with ASD. 
but there's been no large scale randomized controlled trials examining their effectiveness. So what we do have are kind of small retrospective chart reviews. And so one looked at SSRIs in youth, which showed a 55% um, improvement in anxiety. Um, there were two citalopram studies in the early 2000s that demonstrated a reduction in anxiety. And the fluvoxamine was not shown to be efficacious overall, but it is possible that females may respond more to it. Fluoxetine reduced obsessive compulsive behaviors, but there was no significant reduction in anxiety. And so in, of, of importance, um, there were high rates of adverse effects, especially behavioral activation symptoms. Dusperione is an anxiolytic, and there have been a couple of studies that have shown improvements in anxiety, and it was overall well tolerated. So pharmacological studies were sparse and mostly outdated. And so they have also been mostly like open label or chart reviews with small sample sizes. And so large randomized controlled medica medication trials are currently lacking. And so due to the risk of subjecting kids to potential side effects, slow titration with careful monitoring is indicated. So for future directions, um, reliable and valid psychiatric instruments are needed to accurately assess anxiety in youth with ASD. Um, additional research is needed on effectiveness of CBT in older adolescents, as most were in school-age children. A more racial and ethnic diversity is needed, as most of the participants were Caucasian and male. Um, Long-term follow-up needs to be examined to assess for maintenance of treatment gains and also improving accessibility to modified CBT in the community. And lastly, we desperately need large clinical trials comparing pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic treatments of anxiety. And so currently there's the STAR trial at mine looking at CBT versus sertraline. So I'm very excited to see what that will show. So I want to thank and acknowledge the LEND training program and my supervisor, Dr. Unger, for her guidance during the LEND program and always being so readily accessible. So I have, a, this is Len, I have a question. Uh, first of all, what a wonderful presentation. You know, I think sometimes these literature review presentations are not very exciting or interesting. It's so well organized. I really, really appreciate that. It was terrific. Thank you, Joanne. Um, so um, my, my question is, if you have any, uh, thoughts about why there were so, so few pharmacological treatments. Um, in, in other areas, I, th I think sometimes pharmacology is kind of the first route rather than behavioral therapy. Um, and there are certainly lots of uh, treatments for pharmacological treatments for anxiety. So do you have any thoughts after reading the literature why there were so few? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I was actually quite surprised when I was doing the search as well. And, and I think in general, like the research, I mean, I, I'm sure everyone knows has been just very limited in this population and that just more recently over like the past 10 years, it's increased. And, you know, my guess, you know, so I'm, I'm not too sure that, you know, I, I think that it, it takes, it takes a lot of time. It takes money to do these studies. And I wonder if that's been kind of, um, a big barrier to that. John, I wondered if um, there's been a some, sort of a move in the neurodiversity movement to you to def, rather than using the term high functioning autism to define what you mean by that. And I, so I wondered if you could just define what you were what the in the search parameters you were mean by that. Yeah. So I. Yeah, so that was actually a limitation too, in that many studies actually didn't really explain what they meant by high functioning either. So what I did go off of was the IQ of being greater than 70 and just including like their verbal fluency is, is what I- That makes sense. And were, were most of the studies with kids with IQs over 70? Yes, these were at least. And so that's why the CBT came up more frequently. Uh, what's the minimum age for IQ that you included in there? Yeah, so I I believe it was um, seven. It was seven, was the youngest. Thank you. And I see that um, Abby had a question in the chat. Thank you, Shannon, for telling me that. Um, is anxiety higher among the autism population who have limited verbal communication? Do you know? 
Yeah, and so I think this is a really good question. And, you know, it's, it's really hard to say because I think with, because um, we definitely know that anxiety is present in these children as well. But I think because of like the limitation and their ability to communicate, it's harder to assess for anxiety. So I know that it's definitely present. I'm not sure if it's really higher though. And so I think that's why we just need to be able to find like more validated kind of measures for anxiety for these children.